Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot known locally as the February Room is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. Well, it's February here, and if uh, you're getting a little tired of winter like I am, we're here to offer a little respite in the form of a convo with one of Fly Fishing's leading authors, writers, and musicians, uh, Chris Santella. Chris, welcome to the February Room. Justin, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Thanks so much for including me. Well, Chris, you're the author of the 50 Places series of books and uh, and much more, and we'll get into all of that. But um, but you're also a hopelessly addicted steelheader, and I'm hoping that you have a river story for us this morning. Well, you know, when uh, when your lovely wife reached out uh, a while ago to arrange her talk, she mentioned it might be fun to talk about a, a fishing story, and I was, I was racking my brain because I had quite a few, but... I'm going to share one that has a, uh, a a positive ending rather than the many that have unfortunate endings. Um, for those of us that, that live in Portland and uh, the surrounding area, the Deschutes is, is often the primary summer steelhead river and, and trout fishing river to, um, to get over to the Maupin area. In the Warm Springs area where a lot of people fish, it's about two and a half hours from Portland if you take traffic into consideration, which is not that 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 big of a deal, but uh, you just have to get through some suburbs before you get to the more open road. But to get out to the mouth of the Deschutes, I can make it from my house in Northeast Portland in an hour and 20 minutes. And all my steelhead buddies live on the east side of the Willamette, so we cut a lot of uh, travel time off because we're kind of beyond the, the immediate traffic. And being so close to the mouth, we often will go out in the summertime at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. It's an hour and 20 minutes out there, fish till dark. And then uh, during non-pandemic times, we can stop in Hood River at the Double Mountain Brewery and have a great pizza and a few pops and breaks up the trip a little bit. And we're we're home in bed by 1130 or 12. So it's a really world-class fishing experience without that much wear and tear on the the body or the psyche. Um, I would say that, you know, when you go out to the mouth of the Deschutes, there there are are a couple little parking areas and one camping area there. You just park your car, wait her up, and, you know, it's anywhere from, uh, you know, a half mile to three miles hike to uh, get to good water. And, and I have to say, I'm, I'm always saying this to, to people, and then as soon as I say it, I wonder if I'm going to ruin the spot for myself. But I really feel that, that that lower few miles of the Deschutes is some of the best swinging water that I've seen anywhere. Uh, a lot of varying depth. There are lots of little chutes and channels and crevasses out there. For the fish to lie in it's in relatively shallow water so you can cover it well with a fly and uh there's so much water that even though you do get a fair number of anglers out there especially say in it's september it's it's never impossible to find a decent stretch of water or to come in behind someone and have great water and, and you know summer steelhead they're moving especially if you're fishing in the you know the near uh, the low light hours, that's when they're they're moving up river. So I feel like every time you come into a run or a pool, it doesn't matter if someone's just gone through, you have a decent chance. And, right. uh, you know, when, when you're steelhead fishing, I, I feel at least in the summertime out there, I've got a 50-50 chance of, a, of at least getting a good grab or maybe hooking a fish briefly, whether you land it or not is another thing. And for steelhead fishing, 50% chance if one fish is, feels pretty good, Um, but, um, I've always heard stories of people stepping into a spot and hooking five or six fish 
without ever leaving that spot. You know, you just happen, people happen to catch a pod coming in or they're, they're resting for some reason out in that holding water in front of that spot. And I had never had an experience anywhere approaching that. I think maybe I'd had a few days where I'd cook three or four fish and, and that seemed like a pretty epic experience for me. On this one day in particular, I think it was September 2014 or 2015, the dates are, as I become older, all the dates are becoming a little hazier. But uh, <laughs> one of my one of my fishing buddies, uh, a guy named Mike Marcus and I, w went out there for the afternoon run. Uh, he was, I'm self-employed as a, as a writer, so I can kind of go anytime. And he was, uh, at the time, uh, a self-employed architect. So we could kind of sneak away when the, the whim moved us. We went out and uh, there's one spot in particular in that lower mile or two of river on the east side that's called Blackberry um, because, believe it or not, there used to be a bunch of blackberry bushes growing there. They were wiped out in the fire that came through uh, a couple of years ago, slowly growing back now, but it looks a lot different than it used to. But at that point, there was a very thick bramble of blackberry bushes and there's a, one very pronounced rock and the uh, spin casters and spoon guys, they're often planted on this rock and they don't care if the fly guys fish around them, but they're never gonna move and they're often right in the heart of it. And I happened to be walking up this afternoon and it was probably about 4.30, so the sun was still pretty high and it was completely open, no one around. Uh, wow. Maybe a function of it being, you know, like a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday, but I stepped in and uh, Mike went to a run that's just a few hundred yards further up the river. And I fished through it once and, and near the bottom, you know, what I consider the, the main bucket, you know, it's, it's a 40 or 50 yard piece of water. It's not huge, but, um, you know, it takes, it takes 20 or 30 minutes to fish through it. And I, I got to the, near the bottom of the bucket and hooked a fish, landed. I think, oh, this is great. Um, I was about to, to go upstream to another run I like. And then I, I had that little voice in the back of my head saying, you know, you don't leave fish to find fish. And there was obviously at least one fish in there. And oftentimes when there, where there's one, there might be more. So I went to the top of the run, fished through again, about in the middle of the run, I got another fish. And that one, that one came off as I was trying to land it, but I figured, oh, I'm onto something good here. And I saw Mike, he just kind of came around a little bend in the river upstream and I started waving to him to come down. And I stepped in again at the top, hooked another fish and fought it, worked it down to the, to the bottom of the softer water, released and I said, Mike, step in. Cause he had come down at that point. He stepped in, he made a few casts, he hooked a fish. He wow. came down to the bottom of the pool, played it, released it. I stepped in, I hooked a fish. This went on for about an hour and a half. We hooked 19 steelhead in that one little Jeez. run on, wow. on slow flies. Uh, I have never had any experience remotely approaching that since. Matter of fact, it, I think I went 10 more times after that outing including one guided trip because I had a friend from out of town visiting and I wanted to make sure that she got the best experience. Ten trips, I didn't touch a thing after that. <laughs> You'd angered the god. <laughs> I, I sure did, but but uh, I hope whenever I, I think about that, that, that the wonders of that lower to shoots and the Blackberry run, that's, that's the story I kind of think of. And, and I'm always, I've, I've, I don't know, maybe when I started out steelhead fishing and didn't know as much about it, I, I had some friends who were more experienced, but they they kept their cards pretty close to their chest about spots of how the fishing was. And I think I started out a little bit that way, but I've, I've really come around to the idea that, you know, there's plenty of, there's plenty of water, there's plenty of time. Um, I'd rather be open with information and, and share it and have, help people have a good time rather than trying to be secretive. Life's, life's too short for that. And yeah, I, also I, I, I also realized early on, I think that no matter how, how much you want to be the first piece person on a, on a piece of water, 
there's always someone that's going to get up earlier or hike further. And <laughs> if you make your, if you hang the success or the happiness of your day upon getting spot A or spot B, you're probably going to be very disappointed because someone's going to beat it to you. So just, you know, just enjoy what you have and, and share and, and it, it'll come back to you perhaps karmically in the end. Well said. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I went back to the Deschutes this, this last fall for the first time in several years. And, um, and I, I'd been on a, a bit of a, uh, a drought to say the least myself. And I'd attributed that to um, the fact that uh, when I lived in central Oregon and I, I had owned a fly shop and an outfitting business for a few years with another, you know, kind of deadbeat fishing bum. And um, I, we had come up with a bumper sticker that said, there's no steelhead in Montana. And, uh, and then, you know, in a, in a display of hypocrisy, I end up moving to Montana. So then <laughs> the steelhead gods were angry with me. And uh, I went several years before I had caught one and uh, I'd fished, you know, mostly winter steelhead, but some summer steelhead too. Um, not a lot, but, you know, getting out when I could over the last several years. And, and we got lucky last fall, you know, as I, I'm sure you experienced the white river was doing its thing. It was puking bit last year and it was hard to catch it and you know we just threw a we just threw a dart at a calendar and went over there and hit a couple days when the lower river was actually in shape and and i caught a real nice fish we hooked like four in two days which we thought was great that's then, a great that's a good that's a good trip yeah for sure and then you know we hightailed it out of there and went trout fishing before things got worse so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta as a I, I can't say that kenny rogers was on the high end of my pantheon of, of country artists that I enjoy, but uh, no one to hold them, no one to fold them was, uh, was wise <laughs> advice. Um, For sure. Maybe he was a steelhead angler. He maybe knows. so. Uh, well, it's funny because we, I, I do a float most years, a max to the mouth float with a, with, with a group of friends. And we happened to go, I think it was the week before, um, the week before Memorial Day, excuse me, Labor Day, and the the river kind of had been out a lot, but it kind of came in for that for that three or four days that we were on the water. But even though you know it was kind of prime time and the water was was cooler and and clearer, I think we had five pretty good rods. And I think in you know three full days of angling, I think we hooked maybe nine or ten fish. So it was it was not fast and furious. I mean, as you know, the runs are. The runs are in trouble. There, there's just no, no question about it. Um, and uh, I think we're we're seeing that there'll be there'll be an occasionally a a, a little better year, but uh, I think that uh, it's going to be tough times for a while. And as I'm sure you probably heard, um, the uh, in Washington State, they declared an, an emergency for all steelhead and salmon just just the other day, and that that the runs are in danger of going extinct. They finally said that where uh, before, I think it was perhaps only amongst the, the more uh, yeah. hardened conservationists uh, saying that, but this was, this was the state coming out and saying it. So it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a tough time for, for anadromous anglers uh, or anadromous, I should say anadromous fish anglers. Uh, but uh, I, I joke with a friend and I actually wrote a little short story about this, that, that at some point we may all be carp fishermen, but uh, that, that time hasn't come yet. And now a brief message from our sponsors. Introducing the Trist All Fly Kit, Composite Development's latest game-changing innovation. Utilizing the same butt section, the All Fly morphs from five weight to an eight weight via interchangeable sections. Need a little more length? Pop the extender into place and the 9-foot rod becomes a 10-footer. All housed within an ingenious tri-folding magnet rod tube, the Allfly is the most versatile fly fishing tool ever devised, negating the need for multiple rods. Switch from delicate presentations with tiny parachutes to hucking gaudy coneheads. This package must be seen to be believed. Go to cd-fishing.us, click the video tab, and see the Trist Allfly in action. And remember to go fishing. I'm gearing up to head to the South Coast here in a few weeks. So I've been, you know, sitting down here tying flies that take me an hour that I'm probably just going to go, 
you know, flog the river with for three days and, and not touch a fish, but that's all right. You're just kind of there to dream anyway. Well, if you, if, if it were me, I, I would, I would spend an hour and then lose it on the first cast. On a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, where, where, where are you going to be heading by the way? Uh, I'm going to go down to the South coast of Oregon um, and fish with a buddy of mine, John Hazlett. I don't know if you've ever met him. I, I, um, I think I have met, met John. I certainly know the, know the name. Well, the reason, the reason I ask is that yeah. I, I have never gone down to fish the Smith, you know, right on the border. And uh, I'm going to meet a buddy from the, the Bay area and uh, we're going to try to fish the Smith and the Checo for a few days. So we'll be down in the same country. That's one of the neatest rivers. Um, we did a, uh, a, about the same time we did that show um, that you appeared on, um, we did a, a show down there with um, the local conservation organization down there. And, you know, we got to spend a couple of days floating the, the, the Smith, the, the rapid, you know, turbulent section, which was just a blast. Um, and then swung some flies on the lower river. I didn't hook any fish um, myself on that trip. Uh, but it was sure neat, and I'm planning on going. I'm going to try to sneak down there on this trip, and and hit that if it uh, if it makes sense to do that. Um, yeah, that lower Smith is just man. We'll have to uh, we'll have to compare some compare some notes offline because we might be down there about the same time, and I think we're going to drag Let's a boat do down. So if you so if uh, the stars align properly, perhaps I, you could uh, you could be in the third seat. Whoa, that that would be epic. Okay, um, yeah, it's it's that that place was rowdy, man. Um, we were with a guy named Rich Zellman who lived on the river, and um, and yeah, we had to we had to portage uh, one rapid every day. That was man, I mean, he was calling it a class five, and it certainly looked like that. But um, but yeah, that's an amazing place. Let's definitely keep in touch on that for sure. I don't I don't know where else we're going to fish. I kind of have one day to do my own thing and then I'm just going to kind of leave it up to John to take take me wherever he thinks we might have a chance. So I'm sure he'll be he'll be dialed in and those, you know, those those rivers fluctuate so much day to day depending on on rain and and myriad other conditions. So uh, having the local intel is is valuable anywhere but especially i'd say on the winter steelhead rivers for sure and that zone i love because there's so many rivers um and north coast too but uh you can always buy even if it pours rain on you you can find some you can find some you know clear water to to go to go flog so there's just a lot of options down there in that southern zone so you know you're you're best known for uh, for the 50 Places series of books, even for people that may not recognize your name, they've probably seen your books um, over the years in bookstores. How many of those do you have out now? It's it's there's I saw golf and hike and dive and how many of how many of those different publications are, are there in the 50 Places series? I, I think we're up to 17. Man, what was uh, what was the impetus for the first one? Fly 50 Places to Fly Fish Before You Die was the first one, right? Sure was. Well, I'll I'll tell you. Um, I had my my background. I mean, I had been an English major in college, and and writing was always a, you know, if not a great skill, at least a quasi skill that I had, and that led me sort of to work around um, advertising for a while as a copywriter, and then I realized that the people who had manager somewhere in their name made a little better money and my wife and I were living in the in San Francisco then and I kind of branched out and started working for software companies around in a kind of a marketing management uh, capacity and but was writing on the side I always I I really wanted to one day publish a book but I realized from just the, the little research I'd done that the path to getting a, a book published by a mainstream publisher was not sit down and write a book. It was build a portfolio, um, you know, develop a, a concise, easily explainable idea, write a, you know, a book proposal, which is said, which I always describe to people as a business plan for a book. And, yes. uh, but then find an agent and and then hopefully work with them to help sell the project. 
Um, and as we, when we moved up to Oregon and I was more of a freelance guy, I had a few, you know, longer term contracts still with some of these software companies, but, um, I was spending more and more time writing articles, but I realized honestly that just, it just didn't pay anything. And I had, we just had our first child had our first mortgage and I realized, man, I've got, if I'm going to spend, you know, 15 hours a week trying to write fishing articles, I got to figure out some sort of way to, to monetize this, or I can't justify it when I can bill a lot more for the, for the marketing communications work. So that was when I kind of had started to, to really research how you, how you can get an agent and what it takes to publish a nonfiction book. And I, I had always loved fly fishing and I realized that, that, uh, you know, when I, when I got together with friends to, to go fish a local river, which whether this was the Truckee, you know, down in California when I lived there or the Deschutes or the Sandy, uh, in, in Oregon, you know, what would happen on the ride out there or if we're having, you know, beers in the pub afterwards, we'd talk about those places that we'd like to go sometime. And, uh, so that was the, I think that started the notion of this sort of bucket list thing before I think the, the whole bucket list culture, I think had not really quite started. This is like 2002 at this point. So, and oddly, I'm not like a list or bucket list really sort of person, which is, is kind of funny that I ended up writing these books, but. Um, well, yeah, you already caught so, 19 steelhead in a day. So you're kind right. of. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, um, so I had, I sort of had this idea of this sort of bucket list notion and um, I managed to get an agent and we, I think right as she was trying to, to sell the book, that was when the Iraq war started. So publishers weren't that interested in, in could in puffy leisure oriented projects. So it was dead for a while, but then, Things seem to get resolved fairly quickly. You may remember the speech on the aircraft carrier. Uh, sure. Uh, but so so they were able to she, – my agent, uh, Stephanie Rostin, was able to go out and sell the idea. And I really thought at the time it was going to be a one-off. I'd have a, a book to show my kids when they were old enough or my grandkids if we ever have any and, and that that would be that. And – the the book came out in uh, I think it was the spring of 2004, and you know I had the marketing background and I real I I didn't know much about publishing but I knew that uh, the publishers if they have you know 80 or 100 titles that come out in a given year uh, or a given season they don't have a lot of bandwidth to go out there and and try to market those titles or do PR for them. So I figured any heavy lifting I could do would help all parties. So that first year when that book came out, I I pitched probably every outdoor editor in the country on, you know, just trying to do some little blurblet about the book. And I did lots of fly shop appearances and bookstore appearances. And I, I think that that really helped them the uh, the book get a little bit of traction and I think it did a lot better than the publisher ever imagined it would so that was when they came to me and said uh, you know what do you think about doing a golf book and oddly enough that's something else or perhaps not so oddly because I think a lot of a lot of fly anglers uh, dally in golf and and vice versa for, for sure. Uh, and uh, so, I, and I had written a lot about golf too. So I, I said, sure. And we applied the same formula, the formula being, you know, interview people from around the, the golf world or in the first case around the fishing world and ask them to talk about a favorite experience or one that's, that's special to them. And then, and then use that interview as a jumping off point to write the little essay. And the golf book was picked up in um, the real simple uh, holiday gift giving issue, which I, at least at that time, this is this is 2005 now, that was about 
as good of a promotional vehicle as you could have. And I remember, you know, that it was before Thanksgiving that year and a friend called me, he said, look on Amazon. And he said, your, your, your book's number 33. And I said, you mean number 33 in sports? And he said, no, it's number 33. <laughs> and uh, wow. because of that real simple, the, the golf book had, had you know, done very well. And they actually ran out of, they ran out of copies, so they weren't able to ship anymore. But um, I think that, you know, after after that little success, commercially anyway, the publisher saw that this had legs and I was either um, too lazy to think otherwise or recognize that this was a this was an opportunity and, um, you know, kept kept moving forward. I remember I had a real crisis of confidence when they asked me to do a the third one was a sailing book and my I had been on a sailboat I think three times and and <laughs> frankly hated it uh so I I had trouble imagining myself mustering uh enthusiasm for that pastime but then I, I was able to step back from it and realize okay I don't have to have deep subject expertise to write about these things it's helpful if you know a little bit but it was it was not essential what i needed to understand was what gets someone excited about sailing and you know in that case they're the people that rate it's all about racing so that you know they're famous racing venues and for other people it's about exploring uncharted waters and places so there's there's that group and then there's a group that's more like let's Let's not let the sailing get too much in the way of our gin and tonics, but, you know, we'll, we'll be on the boat and float somewhere. So, you know, I tried to try to think of it in terms of capturing some of those different styles of venues and how people related to them. And, and that provided a, a bit of a roadmap to uh, to pull that off. And, you know, I I I. Think you know you're 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 an independent freelance kind of kind of guy, Justin. So you realize what I realized at least even before I started writing the books is that to make that work, you need to have one steady thing that is generating a little bit of income every month. So you know basically you know you sort of like cover your cover your insurance and your mortgage sort of sort of thing. Yeah. And if you don't have if you don't have that that one client or that one recurring project, it's going to be tough to pull it off unless you you know you got a lot of bank to get yourself going. And for me, I realized that um, the Fifty Places books could be that thing. And I also realized that each time a new Fifty Places book came out, uh, booksellers would stock up on some of the other 50 places titles that the so-called backlist and you know there'd be a nice little bump in royalties I and mean, when you have you know i think 12 or 13 of the books are have earned out as they say or i, I you know I, i've exceeded the, the advance the publisher gave me so i'm getting royalties on them now even if it's only you know, a little bit for each book, it, it adds up twice a year. It's the, it's the, as I've heard musician friends say, it's, it's the mailbox money. Yeah. Um, right. Like <laughs> I remember Ray Wiley Hubbard once said that, cause he disappeared for a long time. He's back now, which right. you probably know, but yeah. uh, he disappeared for a long time. And, you know, he, he equated that to being able to go out and get that mailbox check for writing um, up against the wall, redneck mother, I think. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have any reason to work. So he, he didn't work for a long time, but anyway. Yeah. So that may, that, that may be more, more than you wanted, wanted to know about the, uh, the book business. No, not at all. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's, I've, I've always, I've always uh, been curious um, how you pulled how you pulled all that off, and uh, it's it's awesome. Um, and then fifty more places to fly fish came out because I remember I received that as a Christmas gift one year. You probably um, I, the poor fly fishers of of America. I, I bet that there's a, a a group of them that have probably received each of the fly fishing books three or four times. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> yeah, I, apologize, hey, I, I apologize for, for that. Man, you're, yeah, you're all for that. <laughs> but uh, no, it was it was when we when we I think that that was 
2011 or 2012 and yeah it was really it was really fun to be able to return to that topic because I, I had learned a lot more about uh, some of the the venues around the world and had had the chance to to travel more than I had when I did the first book so uh, and, and knew I, I would say knew some of the more esoteric characters around the fly fishing world so it was it was i was able to to speak to some neat people and and probably be a bit more incisive in terms of of the the interviews and capturing some of the the nuances of of place yeah yep yeah, definitely having um that uh resource to tap into helps absolutely absolutely well, awesome. So the first time I met you, this was at least a decade ago, um, and you had agreed uh, to allow us film a live performance with your band, um, Catch and Release, correct? That is correct, and I remember very well because uh, you you folks were in town with, uh, with Conway Bowman, who is a uh, a good friend of mine, and uh, I, I want to thank you. You guys have been doing some surgeon fishing. Surgeon. And, surgeon fishing, correct, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and Jay, he said you were going to be in town and filming. I said, well, you know, would it be fun? Because, of course, uh, as, you, as you might know, uh, Conway is a drummer, uh, and he plays in a right. band that I, I think it's called Dark Globe. They're a little bit more – they're a little more metal uh, – fusiony stuff but uh but very very good as well or i'm sure better than when we are but um i've been playing with these guys now i think since 2008 and uh to have that have that longevity i don't know if you play any any instruments or have friends in bands but a lot of times poorly, especially poorly. amongst younger men uh egos get in the way pretty fast and uh <laughs> bands, bands crash, but I think we're all uh, old enough that we um, we don't take it we take it seriously, but we don't have any unrealistic expectations. And uh, the other guys in the band, I should give them a shout out. It's uh, Sloan Morris, Doug Matier, and Keith Carlson. Uh, Keith is a Keith is a great bass player, and he's also a graphic designer, which is great to have if you have a band because when it comes time to need uh concert posters or cd art uh <laughs> it's great to have a graphic designer in the band the other two guys were both um were both uh music majors so they they have a great grounding in theory and can play many different instruments i'm i'm not bad at the lyrics and maybe coming up with the basic melody and often our process is i'll come in with a pretty basic song and then they'll have great arrangement ideas and can really help flesh it out so and we all work that way they'll they all write songs as well so uh you know i can come in and help tighten up the lyrics a little bit and uh it's been a really fun collaborative process and as a writer um so much of my time is kind of spent alone uh, it's it's really fun to have something like a like a band and music to work at in a collaborative manner. Well, maybe the secret to a band staying together is for all the members to go uh, have their egos kicked in by Steelhead for about a decade. Yeah, <laughs> it certainly it certainly helped. It certainly helped me. <laughs> So uh, on that note, you guys, uh, the, the the song that stuck in that sticks in my head from from uh, that that show was uh, the tug is the drug, which I always equate to steelhead fishing. Um, here we go, and all right, let's hear it. You've got a new uh, a new album which uh, you've dubbed an eco rock opera uh, called The Last Steelhead. Uh, are you going to play us a lick? Well, you know what? What I what I what I thought I'd do is I, I might I I can give you I can give you the tug is the drug, I can give right you on. a new right a song that's going to be on the the we have a new record that's going to come out in about a about a month. It's being in the final mixing now, and we have a red a good redfish song on that one. Um, oh, nice. The uh, if and I'll give you of course the the Earl, but the the last steelhead is really. I, I had done this, and hopefully, this isn't uh, 
shamelessly plugging something, but I think hopefully it's for a good cause. I had done a long article for uh, American Angler Magazine, which sadly now is, as you know, is defunct, but it was about um, the diminishing runs of uh, B-run steelhead, which are the, you know, the big fish that go all the way to the rivers in Idaho. And um, they come through a, a little later uh, because they have so far to go and they'll often duck into the Deschutes and some of the other river systems that are a little cooler than the Columbia as they're making their way to Idaho. But those, those fish runs are all ESA listed and they're struggling in, uh, in talking to some of the, the experts. It was a very dire picture. And from a lot of the background information about the, the science that is pointing at what is harming these fish runs I decided what would be a good way to try to raise a little bit of awareness for the general public about this iconic Pacific Northwest fish that might go extinct while we're uh, in our our lifetimes. Yeah. And maybe I thought trying to tell the story in songs would be a little more appealing than reading a quasi-scientific article about it. So that was what kind of gave rise to the last steelhead. And uh, I had Sims, uh, Wild Steelhead Coalition, the Conservation Angler, and Trout Unlimited all contributed money towards the production of that, which I'm very grateful for. And uh, again, I'll give you the give you the Earl offline, but uh, you can you can stream it. And if people particularly like it i'd be i have some copies i'd be happy to to send you send you a handful and you can give them out as you see fit for sure great so why are you are you feeling are you feeling redfish or are you feeling uh, are you feeling steelhead well i canceled my redfish trip this year um so i'm feeling steelhead all that's, right that's gonna happen for me so well, this is this is like if if catch and release has like a a greatest hits, which I don't think we, we, we do, <laughs> but this would probably be one that we play a lot. So if you don't mind, I'll bang, I'll bang this one out. Oh, let's hear it, man. I, I've got oh. my morning voice here, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. So um. the tug, the drug, the tug, the drug, the tug is the drug Roll out of bed in the middle of the night Jump in the car, drive at the speed of light Ramble up the river past the blackberries and snakes They might so much coffee, man, you've got the shakes Step into the river and you make a thousand casts Utility seems certain, but the bill will never pass Cause the tug is the drug Yes, the tug is the drug Yes, the tug is the drug Yes, the tug is the drug When you take it on the swing It's a ring-a-ding-a-ding It's the tug Well, the junkie's got his works And the drinker's got his gin The missionary's certain he'll be born again I'm standing in a river with a stay rod and a fly Hoping that I'll get a tug before I die Well, the fish are not too many and they really hate the heat And one thing even dumber is the fish don't even eat You went from run to run, do your best not to fall And when you check your leader, there's no fly at all Odds are all against you as the day begins to dawn. You're almost in despair until you feel, until you feel, until you feel your loop is gone. Because the tug is the drug. Yes, 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 the Take it on the swing, it's a ring a ding a ding, it's the tug. Right on, man. Awesome. 
Oh, sweet. That is classic. That's perfect. I'm quite as quite as swiftly, but uh, (laughs) hopefully not too many bad notes. It was money, man. I'm going to take that back to the vice with me and and uh, and finish my selection of winter steelhead flies here. That's perfect. Thank you. All right, um, man. You sent me the you sent me the uh, the last steelhead too, and I got it downloaded. I'm going to put it in my ears while I'm um, while I'm swinging the south coast. So I really appreciate that. That's killer. Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, I can. Uh, I'll uh, I'll shoot you a CD if that's easier too. Oh man, I've learned how to download. Oh, you're, I, it's, you're ahead of me. Yeah, that, that's what 2020 brought me, man. With COVID, I finally had the time to learn how to download. So it's been <laughs> big for me. <laughs> what's uh, what's your favorite steelhead fly, Chris? Well, you know, for, the- for for a long time, and maybe it still is kind of a, a go to. I I I like a freight train. And I, it's it's for a couple reasons. I on the I fish the Deschutes probably more than any other river, and it seems like on the Deschutes, more sparse flies were have worked better for me than more heavily dressed flies. And you know, what if the water clarity is there, and these are summer fish, so they're willing to move. It's not that deep of water. I, I think it's it's less intimidating to them. I also like I like the white in the wing. Um, because I think that in those low light hours, whether it's you know early morning or you know, or late afternoon into evening, I think it's just a little bit more visible. But uh, I think in in more recent years, I've I've come to accept that there there are two flies you can use steelhead fishing. Um, one is confidence. And the other is doesn't matter. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I, I've also t- a, a good a good fishing buddy and buddy in general of mine, uh, Dave Moskowitz, who uh, is the executive director of the, the Conservation Angler, which has been doing a lot of work to try to protect steelhead in the Columbia Basin. Uh, he introduced me to uh, to a surface fly called the strung out skater that I believe is uh, tied by a gentleman that's down in the Salem Albany area and I'm so sorry Derek Fergus I believe is is his name and it's kind oh, of I like, remember Derek Fergus. I know him yeah he's got it, it's a it has a it's it has kind of a very minimal muggler sort of head and, and then just a, a little marabou tied off the back and it's on a dangle hook and it it certainly doesn't skate high in the water it it dips a lot but dave has showed me in in our many fishing occasions that he that that fly will catch just as many fish as a as a freight train or another harrowing pattern and when you think about it those those flies assuming that you're fishing a floating line they're probably not going much more than a than six inches or a foot below the surface. So if the steelhead can see those, they can certainly see something that's uh, a few inches higher in the water column and arguably something that might be making more of a disturbance. So I- uh, So you think a skater is just as effective as a wet fly I, when it shoots? I, I think that if you have the confidence to use it and the water is clear, I, I think it can be. I mean, a lot of a, a lot of people feel otherwise, but what I've seen fishing alongside Dave is that he'll, if I'm, fishing the, the freight train or a fly du jour or something like that. And he's fishing that skater. He'll, he'll catch just as many as I will sometimes more. Yeah. My, you know, my buddies that have been fishing that river for a long time have pretty much gone to skaters. Um, and uh, I still primarily fish wet flies just because I don't have as much confidence. That, in that's the skaters. Those guys do. Just, I haven't caught any fish on them. So yeah, there you go. What I'll what I'll find myself doing a lot is, I uh, if I get a fish on uh, you know on a, a wet fly, then I'll switch over and and try to stick with the skater the the rest of the outing or the rest of the trip. But uh, until I at least get one one good grab uh, by any almost any means necessary, then I'm I, I have trouble going to the skater. 
Yeah, that uh, the aforementioned trip I did last fall, I I caught a really nice bee run fish in the first fifteen minutes. <laughs> and but I mean, you know that that being said, so that fish maybe that was five years and fifteen minutes in or something. That's right. <laughs> um, it's been a while, but. Uh, but so I got that beautiful fish and, you know, that was more than I could have ever asked for. Um, and then I hooked another one the next morning, another nice big fish, lost it, but didn't care, of course. And so then I switched to a skater for the remainder of the trip and didn't touch another fish. So that's usually how it goes for me, too. No, that's, <laughs> uh, that, that, that is often, often the, the way. And, you know, what I, I have, I'm trying to think, I, I think I've caught steelhead on skaters, uh, maybe six or seven times so it's not 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 that many uh but you know a few of those <laughs> takes some sometimes like if that fly is you know dipping under you know it, the take is not really any different than if you had a had a wet fly you don't really see it but i've had a few where the, those fish just come up and it's the uh it's the toilet bowl kind of take where it seems like all the river drains out from the hole they've they've made in the surface and and, and it, it's it's probably it's worth overlooking a, a few fish that you might get if you are that six inches deeper to see that that kind of a take every 10 years or so yeah for sure um we had this one couple of day session years ago on a, a columbia tributary upstream of the deschutes where they were just eating anything. So we were just, we were catching them on big dead drifted dry flies. You didn't even have to skate them. Would that, was be the, that wouldn't be the John Day, would it? Uh, yeah, you maybe. Can say, you could say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that was, the, I'm sure you were around then when, the, when there was just a million fish in that thing. And for a few years there, it was insane. There were some really good years. I have to say that, uh, you know, we, my, my little, group and I, we found some, we, you know, we found some fish on the Deschutes this year. It was a little tougher going, but we, we fished the John Day. Um, I think it was almost every Tuesday in November and most of December. And the river never came up over five or 600 CFS until just recently. It was a very bony, dry year, but we, we found fish every trip. And this is all in the all in the lower lower most you know just just above uh, uh, the falls, uh, just above the arm you know seven or eight miles basically coming in in the in the Rock Creek area and going up and down right. the river from there, and boy there was just hardly any people and uh, you know it wasn't awesome. we weren't having you know eight fish days but but we, each of us would book one or two and you know can't can't beat that. Can't beat that, man. Yeah, we uh, we were gonna go over there on our trip, and then it was just it was we were probably too early. This was still in October. Who knows? But th it was so low, we just decided against it. One of our buddies went down there and said, "Ah, there's just no water in it." Yeah, but, no, it was it was a it was a very it was a very bony year, and uh, you know the the thing on on that river is you fished it, so you probably know is that. The, the fish hold in very slow, almost froggy water. It's it's a very different right. fishing experience. It's sort of you you think your swing is done, and then wait like another two minutes. <laughs> and, right. as, and as it's yeah. as it's you know inching along that that last couple feet into the real froggy water, that's often where the where the takes will occur. So it, it was hard learning that I, I think i finally kind of figured it out a little bit but you know i know so often we'd go and fish the the heads of the runs there where it really should have been 200 yards down where it's frogging out and start fishing there right and you know what was always curious about the john day is you could go there in like january and catch chrome fish i'm sure that they're still coming well maybe not now but i know there there were fresh fish coming in um on you know new year's eve because we were over there we were over there that day and when my my buddy got a got a really nice very bright fish and you know i know i think that people people fish them hard uh going into you know february and march much further upstream and i think that tends to be 
more of a, a nymphing game at, at that point. And I think that that a few other conservation groups that that pay attention to that region are trying to get some of the regs changed. Like for example, the most egregious um, regulation on that river is that that bait and barbed hooks are allowed. And it is, there are no, there are occasionally are hatchery strays, but there are no hatcheries on the river. These, these are, you know, 95% right. wild fish. Here you have, and, you know, Oregon, you're not supposed to, maybe on the south coast or a few rivers where you can take a steelhead, but generally speaking, Oregon, you're not allowed to, to kill a wild steelhead, yet they're allowing bait and barbed hooks on a all wild fish river. I, I didn't know you. I didn't know that regulation hadn't been changed. No, it's been I, so crazy. Yeah, beyond hey, for for those who who uh, like the steelhead fish and care about the John Day, I think that that be on the lookout because I think this is going to be a campaign that the conservation angler, amongst other groups, is going to try to champion this year, and it should be a no brainer. But who knows? That should be a no brainer. Yeah. But there'll be a lot of backlash. No, there uh, sure. always is. I, I'm wait. I was expecting up, that up on the Olympic Peninsula there was going to be a, a, another a takeover of of the washing of Olympia by angry steelhead guides that not being able to fish out of the boat. But that hasn't occurred yet. Well, I did hear a story about a, a couple that was shot at up there the other day. Oh, so. I don't know. Maybe it's just not in the news yet. <laughs> oh God! Well, hey man, you've got a you got things to do. You got a meeting um, coming up here. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, this is super entertaining. Good to catch up with you. Um, how? Uh, what's the best way for folks to find you and uh, and you know download your music and uh, and and hunt you down? Oh uh, well, my the I, my little. Sort of, it's, it used to be the the business website, but it's and it's still it still serves that purpose. But I have, I'm putting more and more of my own stuff out there. Is uh, is steelhead communicationscom dot com. So uh, no surprise on the favorite fish there. Uh, and I right now we have a lot of our music is out on SoundCloud. I I think that the the younger folks tell me that Bandcamp is where it's at, so I think that we're going to start to be posting more stuff out there. But uh, that's a good starting. Those are two good starting points. Cool, man. Well, thanks again, Chris. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll see you down there on the south coast. Well, be up. I'll drop you a line uh, and and uh, see how the timing might work out. Let's do that. Awesome. Thanks again. Great. You take care. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.